Welcome back to Southeast Asia Radio. This week, we're covering Eid celebrations across Southeast Asia, Hun Sen as Cambodia's new Senate president, and Thailand's proposal for a Schengen-style visa. We'll also cover the historic summit between the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines in Washington last week. I'm Jaffet Kitson. And I'm Lauren Mai. Today is April 18th, 2024, and on this week's interview... We see a bit of a split in the sense that most of the questions that most of the surveys that pose this question don't pose it on a binary. It's not necessarily U.S., China, but they add additional countries to the mix, whether it be Japan, India, or other partners. And when posed sort of in that broad spectrum, it seems to do pretty well. China tends to edge out in some countries, but the United States isn't doing too shabby. Greg and Alina had our very own Andreka Nataligawa to talk about the latest trends in how ASEAN countries perceive the U.S. and China. First, though, let's cover this week's headlines. Eid Mubarak to all of our listeners who celebrate. Millions of Muslims across Southeast Asia marked the end of the holy month of Ramadan last week with celebrations and family gatherings. It's a big month in Southeast Asia. Millions of people travel for the holidays and retail sales across the region increase as much as 40% in some Southeast Asian countries. This one was interesting. In Indonesia, so many people were making journeys home that the Indonesian Navy even deployed a battleship to help transfer residents from Jakarta. Now that's dedication. Still, the celebratory tone this year is undercut by ongoing tensions in both Gaza and Southeast Asia. Ah, that makes sense. Religious leaders across the region called on Muslims to pray for those suffering in Gaza and for both Muslims and non-Muslims to show humanitarian solidarity. In Malaysia, the king called for unity and forgiveness ahead of the holiday as tensions boil over a popular market chain sale of socks bearing the word Allah. And in Indonesia, President Joko Widodo's annual Eid wishes on Twitter and Instagram were overshadowed by criticisms that the illustration may have been AI-generated. It's definitely a holiday season filled with complex emotions. It's a good reminder to keep an eye out for how AI adoption, religious conservatism, and the conflict in Gaza are shaping Southeast Asia these days. On to our next story. Earlier in April, Cambodia's ex-leader Hun Sen was unanimously voted in as Senate president, a key ceremonial position of symbolic importance and with a hand in shaping Cambodia's international diplomacy. Hang on, didn't he hand power over to his son last August? Yeah, he did. Last August, he stepped down as prime minister after 38 years of rule and allowed his son, Hun Manet, to take his place. I wrote about this last month in the latest on Southeast Asia. Yes, great coverage. He was elected to the Senate in late February in an election that saw his ruling Cambodian People's Party win 55 out of the 58 contested seats. Truly a landslide victory. As the current CPP party president, he had always been the presumptive Senate president. But on April 3rd, senators officially and unanimously voted him in. So what does he get as Senate president? The Cambodian Senate is largely a ceremonial body, ratifying measures passed by the lower house or National Assembly. But it's also the highest political symbol of the country, and symbolism matters in Cambodia. So he gets power. That tracks given that he and his family have been slowly consolidating power over every single Cambodian institution in recent years. There's also another perk. As its president, Hun Sen gets to be the acting head of state when the king is overseas, which is quite often. In his first speech as Senate president, he said he wanted to further Cambodia's international diplomacy in his new role. He's certainly trying. On April 9, he came out on social media to defend the Teco Funan Canal Project, a Chinese-funded infrastructure project near Cambodia's border with Vietnam. He also warned the international community not to slander Cambodia for the sake of opposing China. Ah, yikes. Lots to watch out for then in the coming months with the newest rendition of Hun Sen. For our next story, we move to Thailand, where Prime Minister Seta Tavisen is said to be pushing for a joint visa program across six countries, in the style of the EU's Schengen area. Hmm, what would that look like? Under the system proposed by Sita, tourists in Cambodia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Laos, all neighboring countries of Thailand, would be able to freely travel between the countries. Sita is said to be pushing for the program to attract tourists to the country and ultimately boost its economy. I heard he's trying to achieve a target of 80 million tourists a year by 2027. Best of luck to him. Apparently, those six countries were visited by more than 70 million tourists last year, so a Schengen-style system would certainly go a long way in helping them reach their target. But it also tracks with his motto for Southeast Asia in the coming decade, Seamless ASEAN. Okay, sounds good. Yes, it was at the Davos conference this past January. Mm, That makes sense. For our final story, we bring it back to the United States, where President Joe Biden hosted a trilateral summit with Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio and Philippine President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., 
During the summit, they discussed cooperation in the South China Sea, humanitarian assistance and disaster response, and clean energy supply chains. Notably, President Biden announced a new economic corridor in the Philippines called the PGI Luzon Corridor. The first of its kind in the Indo-Pacific, the corridor will support connectivity between Subic Bay, Clark, Manila, and Batangas in the Philippines through high-impact infrastructure projects, including rail and modernizing ports. President Biden also reaffirmed that U.S. commitments to the defense of Japan and the Philippines remain ironclad amid Japan and the Philippines' territorial disputes with China. The summit is a symbolic start to further trilateral engagements between the three countries, particularly in the areas of national and economic security. For a deeper dive into the summit takeaways, please check out Greg Poling and Aaron Murphy's latest commentary. And those were our headlines. Up next, Greg and Alina's chat with Andreka. Stay tuned. Welcome back to another episode of Southeast Asia Radio, folks. As always, I'm Greg Poling with the Center for Strategic International Studies, joined by co-host Alina Noor with the Carnegie Endowment. Hey, Alina. Hey, Greg. Good to see you again. You too. And we're seeing each other over Zoom, despite the fact that you are in L.A. and I was in L.A. two weeks ago and never called you, didn't show up or say hi or anything. That's what real friends Uh, do, I guess. I know. And for that, I'm very sorry. We saw each other in Philadelphia like a month ago. It's fine. No, we saw each other on Zoom there, too. Oh, that's true. Okay, so we haven't seen each other in years. For all I know, Alina's not actually real. And our actual guest today, all the way from down the hall, is Andreka Nadlagawa, Associate Fellow with the Southeast Asia Program at CSIS. Hey, Andreka. Hey, Greg. Hey, Alina. So we've got Andreka on, as we do a couple times a year now, to talk about his latest work. Andreka and I have co-authored a forthcoming report on U.S. and Chinese soft power in Southeast Asia. And this builds on a report we did about a year ago now called Assessing U.S. and Chinese Influence in Southeast Asia, which pulled together all the available public opinion and elite opinion polling data we could find for the region in recent years, paired that with measures for economic indicators, trade development assistance, and so on, to try to get a picture of where preferences lie on a matrix that said, what do elites and the publics in each country think about the US and China? Or, or in other words, who do they prefer to force the choose between the US and China? Who do they see as the most important economic power? Who do they see as the most important strategic power in the region? And now we are updating that same table, but with another set of lines that says, who is the most important, well, I guess, how are we framing this? People to people power, sociocultural power? Yes, that's right. Who is the leading soft power in the region? Spoiler alert for most countries is not China or the United States. But since my name's on the report, why don't I turn it over to Alina to do the interrogation? Good. So I have to say, I haven't read the report, you know, page to page from the first page right to the very end, which I really should have done. So you'll have to excuse me for that, Greg and Andreka. But maybe we could start with the bigger picture of Why do this aggregation of polls and surveys at all? There, I mean, there isn't a whole bunch of really rigorous surveys, as you note yourself in your report, of perceptions of Southeast Asians towards the United States or China. There are some, but it's not a whole lot. What's the value added to what you bring in this report? Let me start off because I'm not... I suspect that Andrake and I have similar, but maybe not identical reasons here. So I don't want to speak for him. So from my perspective, the reason that we've made this work kind of now, I guess, a cornerstone of the South Asia program's annual output is because I think Southeast Asia is getting lumped into this larger conversation in Washington and in other capitals, Tokyo and Brussels and the like, about normative competition in the, quote, global south. And so one of the points we're making over and over is that the global south is a terrible name, frames this as entirely a competition over development or investment or trade, which it's not. And to show that, at least in, in the region for which we are responsible, we're trying to disaggregate the measures of U.S. and Chinese influence, then pair it up with inputs. So we say that the U.S. is, quote, losing country X or China is, quote, winning in country X. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that China is more trusted, more popular, that countries vote the way China would like or some other aspect of revealed preferences? So those are the dependent variables we're trying to pick apart. Actually, measure in some meaningful sense what it means to have greater or lesser influence in the country. And then 
try to analyze the independent variables. So is that related to who has more trade, who has more investment, who's providing more aid, who's got more military exercises? A big component of last year was economic, where admittedly this is a small data set. But one of our key findings was that there doesn't appear to be any correlation, positive or negative, between relative levels of investment or relative levels of ODA or trade and overall preference. There are some countries where the U.S. is still a bigger investor in China and is doing just fine. There's places where China is crushing the U.S. and everybody knows it. And yet you still see strong kind of normative support for the U.S., and here we are now adding another set of factors. And I keep, think we'll keep building on this and hopefully spin it out into a larger project that'll actually bring some coherence to these so far ad hoc efforts. Yeah, and I think I would echo all the above and maybe just chime in to say that there are multiple lines of effort across different research institutions to do this sort of polling work and you know, surveying Southeast Asians about their attitudes to the, toward the United States and China. But what I think our research project is trying to address is the fact that you know, each of these surveys have their own relative weaknesses, right? Whether it be how they're sampling uh, the population, what groups they're sampling, what questions they're asking. And my sense is that if you take any one given survey, it's hard to really extrapolate that out into anything beyond that. But if we take a number of these surveys, multiple, and sort of compare them to each other, check the directionality of what they're arguing, whether there's consistency between them, whether there's uh, shared findings, then we get a better picture of what might be happening on the ground. And so I think it's you know doing that extra work of bringing all this material together, adding in the additional context, like some of the trade and investment statistics that we're tracking, and hopefully providing a more holistic perspective of you know Southeast Asian perspectives toward the United States and China. Yeah, you mentioned data set. I think the IC's sample size is a little under 2,000. What is the sample size of, I guess, the total sample size of the different polls and surveys that you've aggregated for your report? I'll let Andre could test himself to see if he remembers the exact numbers for every single survey. It's a pretty thick methodology section in how we weighted each survey. I'll just say that we we're careful to separate these. So the matrix that we have up at the top, the table, it doesn't say opinion in Thailand, opinion in Indonesia. It says elite opinion and public opinion because those are two very different things. Public opinion polling is a rigorous statistical activity and you have best standards on what counts as nationally representative and what doesn't, what are acceptable confidence intervals and, and so on. Elite opinion is more art than science and that's mostly what we have. So when we talk about ICS, uh, Institute for South Asia Studies, or we talk about the Foreign Policy Council of Indonesia or Amador Research Services, all of which are in these data sets, we can compare them with each other and with similar elite opinion polls, for instance, like the Chicago Council or, or the East West Centers ASEAN Matters for America surveys here in the States. But there's really no rigorous count, no rigorous standard. We'll admit we're making judgment calls here that 100 people in Brunei with a population of 400,000 is more representative than 100 people in Indonesia with 270 million plus. How much more? That's up to opinion. Andre, got anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to crunch the numbers on exactly how many people are sort of captured in the database and in our data set. But echoing Greg, again, part of the challenge is also just between countries. And I think Greg alluded to this, right? Just what might seem like a good number of survey response in a country like Brunei might mean something completely different in a country like Indonesia, just given the scale. And so I think that's one of the challenges that we're seeing as we're collecting data is that for some of the larger countries in the region, countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, the data that we have is just not quite as reliable as we want it to be. That's something that we're thinking about moving forward in terms of how do we build out a better data set and what sort of data do we need uh, to get to that point where these results are more more reliable. Alina, one kind of illustration of the problem here. So we have on each of these questions that we're trying to get at, so overall preference, economic, strategic, and soft power preference, we have... Your options are U.S., China, or toss-up. And the way we define those is pretty rigorous for the public opinion based on whether or not it's it's within the margin of error, mostly, for these polls. For elite opinion, how you do that's a little tricky. I mean, one of the things we introduce is we are deeply skeptical of wild swings in elite opinion from one year to the next – 
And one of the reasons for that is not only are the sample sizes relatively small in elite opinion polls, almost by definition, but there's almost never transparency on who is in the survey. So like if you and I are getting emails from the Chicago Council or East West Center ISIS, and we answer every year, and we are always two of the 100 being asked, that's not rigorous in the same way that a random sample in public opinion polling is. So we're always a little skeptical that elite opinion polling has an echo chamber effect. I mean, almost by definition, you are polling the people you know or the people on your list or the people who are self-selecting because they went to certain websites. I mean, if I were to be counted as part of elite opinion, my opinion could wildly swing from one year to another, right? Nobody would ever know that. And it does in this year in particular, especially in the wake of Gaza. But one of the things we point out, we have to, we also have to be a little skeptical about wild swings on a single year. So in elite polling, we're pretty clear that if a country went from strong pro-China, strong U.S. or vice versa in two consecutive years, we count that as a toss-up for the first year of the swing because people don't tend to change fundamental deep-held opinions. People might signal certain things to a pollster, but unless you see that held steady over multiple years, I'm a little skeptical. We've seen this, for instance, with, I think last year, we noted it with both the Lao and Cambodian elites, where you were seeing like 50-point swings on certain questions from one year to the next in ICS, which like people don't change the way they view the world in fundamental ways overnight. Well, I guess, you know, we started getting to some of the substantive issues. So maybe let's dig a little deeper into that. What were some of your really stark, remarkable findings that differed from last year's report? I'll jump down on the sort of people-to-people ties aspect uh, that we've been looking at with this report because we didn't include that as a measure last year. As we were approaching this report, I think the thinking was that it was just such a big part of the relationship, both between the United States and Southeast Asia and between China and Southeast Asia. So we wanted to make sure we were better capturing that. And so we've tapped a number of different resources. There have been a few questions on this subject in the annual ICS reports. There's a lot of reporting out there in terms of student mobility figures, for example. And I think it's yielded some interesting findings. I mean, if you go back to the 2023 ICS report, the United States does pretty well in terms of just, for instance, you know, Southeast Asian elites are polled on which country they would they would favor as a uh, destination for education if cost wasn't a factor. The United States, I think, ranks pretty highly on that front. Whether that translates into actual numbers of students going to the United States is something else. That's a different factor, and that's they've got all sorts of issues related to it in terms of cost and feasibility. At the very least, the most Southeast Asians t- still seem to view the United States as sort of a leading figure there. On on the South power front, I think as Greg alluded to at the top of the call, we see a bit of a split in the sense that most of the questions that most of the surveys that pose this question don't pose it on a binary. It's not necessarily U.S.-China, but they add additional countries to the mix, whether it be Japan, India, or other partners. And when posed sort of in that broad spectrum, it seems to do pretty well. China tends to edge out in some countries, but the United States isn't doing too shabby. So at least on the soft power front, at least in terms of a desired destination for education, the United States is doing pretty well. But that isn't everything. And, you know, there's lots of other parts of the relationship. On the educational piece, and the interesting finding is there's a clear preference for the U.S. over China and most of the region as a potential destination for education. It doesn't, in many places, it loses out to, say, the U.K. But I don't know that there was any country in which China was at the top of the list of preferred destinations. But you do have a lot of people going to China for school. Whereas uh, there's plenty of countries, I think, in the data set where there's a clear preference for the U.S., but cost and visa issues make it much, much more difficult. So you have an, you know, almost an inverse picture here where people would love to go to the U.S., but do it some far smaller numbers than you'd expect. Whereas there's far more people going to China for education than you would expect, given how few people actually want to in the region. Beyond the people-to-people numbers, the biggest trends or the biggest changes we'll be making to the overall table from last year, um, and Andrea, please correct me if I miss any, I think as you'd expect, mostly be negative for the US, but not kind of overwhelming, not as gloomy as the news might lead you to believe. So we will move Thailand public opinion, I think, from pro-US to toss up. 
which we were candid last year that we didn't have particularly recent public opinion. So it was already only a medium confidence finding last year on Thailand. Now we'll have a new forthcoming public opinion survey that's much more recent and that gives us high confidence that the U.S. and China are pretty much neck and neck, which isn't surprising, I guess, given Thailand's longstanding preference for bamboo diplomacy. We will move Malaysia, Malaysian elites, I think, from a toss up to the pro-China category in the overall question, which is where the Malaysian public already was. And we will, I think Indonesian elite opinion was already listed as a toss up with low confidence last year. It will still be a toss up, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andreka. I think our debate is we still haven't quite decided how to measure the confidence there. And this gets into the issue with elite opinion polls. We have more than one now from different outlets, but all with relatively small sample sizes. So I would say, as you'd expect, particularly post-Gaza, we are seeing a modest downturn in opinion of the U.S. Not necessarily a huge uptick in opinion about China. My big question looking at next year is going to be how deeply held is this? Is this just a broad but relatively shallow display of anger toward Israel with the U.S. being used as a proxy? Or is this a more systematic downturn in at least the Muslim majority countries of Southeast Asia, like what we saw under the Bush administration? A number of things in both your answers. I think to get back to the soft power ties. Was there a reason that you chose to focus on student mobility? It seems to me that one of the interesting indicators that you may have considered, I don't know, but that doesn't seem to be reflected in the the report, at least in its draft form that I read, is the number of just tourist visitors to China and the US. And I think if just off the top of my head, you'll probably see higher numbers to China, particularly after China loosened its visa restrictions, just because of the proximity and and travel distance. But I think that if you were to include that, you'd see pretty interesting results. So that's on soft power, and you can answer and respond to that as you like. But I do also want to dig into this post-Gaza situation a little more and add to that kind of the Trump factor or, you know, the 2024 U.S. presidential election factor and how that might change many things in your report next year. So respond to that as you see fit. Amy Andreka? On the tourism question, you know, I, I would expect you would maybe see similar trends as in education in the sense that China is just a much more accessible tourist destination now that things are opening up again for Southeast Asian nationals. ICS in 2023, I think, did include a question on preferred tourist destinations. And I think if you look at the aggregate sort of Southeast Asian response, I think they landed, China landed at somewhere around 3% whereas the United States was at 9%. So both still far dwarfed by countries like Japan, other ASEAN countries, the EU. But on a relative basis, there still seems to be an edge for the United States. But again, getting a tourist visa and getting all those things together is a challenge for most Southeast Asians, but certainly something we can look to incorporate since this is still a draft. So as Andre said, I think we'll continue to incorporate more things. And this is, you know, we see this as a at least for the time being, a perennial work stream for the program where we want to find not just the data that's most available, but the data that we think is most likely to affect the top line numbers. We're not just collecting data for the fun of it. I think what we want to do is try to get a sense of what moves the needle most in overall influence and how we define that. And so Gut reaction tells me that time spent studying is more likely than time spent as a tourist to have a overall impression on how one kind of thinks normatively about the U.S. or the West or Japan versus China. I also just want to caution again that we should keep in mind the difference between elite and public opinion here. Almost all of these figures for tourism and education come from elites and where the most well-heeled Southeast Asians are interested or able to study or travel is probably not reflective of where most Southeast Asians are actually able to study or travel. That's true. Any response to Gaza plus U.S. presidential election 2024? I'm interested in in Andreka's answer here. I guess I would say 
we still don't know. What always happens with these things is that you get good survey, whether it's from ICS or FPCI or Pew or whoever, and they are pretty clear about the the limitations of the data. But then the journalists grab it and they write it, you know, the lead based on whatever most recently happened. So I don't want to fall into that trap of over-interpreting data we see. I don't think that we're seeing a Trump factor worked into this data yet. For one thing, we already went through four years of Trump, and it didn't hurt the U.S. as much as you'd think among elite opinion in the comparable surveys we have, far less, for instance, than we saw under the Bush administration. So I mean, maybe we'll get more data next year that'll tell us differently. I think it's a little early to assume that most Southeast Asian, even most Southeast Asian elites are really factoring in Trump especially when these surveys were made mostly in mid to late 2023. But there is a very clear shift between public opinion and elite opinion, well, certainly elite opinion, in Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia for those surveys done before and after last October. And so I am willing to take what I don't think is a very big leap to say that is Gaza-related. And you don't see that reflected in opinion, for instance, in the Philippines, Vietnam, or Thailand in any measurable way. You only see it in the three Muslim-majority countries. I'll echo all the above, just toss in my two cents about the Gaza question. You know, I certainly think that's driving some of the shifts that we're seeing in sort of that binary U.S.-China question among the Muslim-majority countries. But I do think that response is, and I think Greg alluded to this earlier, again, more of a signal of displeasure with the United States rather than an endorsement or increase in positive feelings toward China. I think... The question then becomes sort of what does this mean for how Southeast Asian countries engage with the United States or with China? You know, what does that actually mean in practical terms? And I think for that question, it's too early to say. And I think some of these pronouncements about Southeast Asia is choosing a side, you know, sort of the media reporting around this, I think, has been a bit breathless. But in practical terms, I mean, if you look at the past few months at how Southeast Asian countries and the Muslim majority countries in particular have engaged around the issue of Gaza and engaged with the United States. I mean, President Jokowi still came to Washington and still elevated the relationship with the United States. Gaza was a part of that discussion. You know, I think the point being, it's too early to say what this is sort of the long term impact will have on the relationship. Maybe we'll revisit this conversation next year and see what happens. Because I don't want us, well, we already have buried the lead 25 minutes in, but I mean, the one big takeaway I would leave out there is in as much as the reporting following the latest ICS survey has focused on this idea that the region for the first time is choosing China over the U.S., which I don't think is ICS's takeaway, that reporting is at best premature and I think most likely false. One, there's some methodological issues with the way that ICS reports their data. They are trying to capture institutional not regional opinion. That's why they give Laos the same weight as Indonesia. So that's one big problem. The other is, I just, I don't think that's what the data shows. The data tells us, and it, particularly when you compile ICS with all the other data that's available, clear anxiety about China. Sure, anxiety about the U.S., but not the same level. Clear support for other U.S. allies, most especially Japan. Clear preferences, elite and public, for the U.S. in Philippines, in Vietnam. Continued support for the U.S. among elites in Cambodia, surprisingly enough. I think we've got plenty of anecdata to tell us the average Myanmar citizen is skeptical of China. We already knew that the U.S. wasn't doing great in Malaysia and Brunei. So the only thing that's really changed at the end of the day here is a single finding about elites in Indonesia. I think we should all be cautious about just how small a sample size this is. ICS did increase in numbers, but it's 200 people one time in a population of 270 million. And two, when you dig into that data, there's also a lot of anxiety about China within the Indonesian samples in both ICS and the recent Foreign Policy Council of Indonesia surveys that suggests that maybe we shouldn't read so much into kind of a forced binary that you ask people a month after the war in Gaza. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I think there's been a whole lot of hoo-ha about not very much. And I don't mean that in a denigrating way of the IC's Yusuf Insha Institute survey. I think the sample size is small. It's confined to elites. And when I've had to answer those questions, and maybe you've had this experience too, Greg and Andreka, you know, I've always been really confounded as to how to answer questions that 
put you in a very strict binary and I'll just leave it and then maybe I'll get back to it like two, three days later and still not have a simple answer. So yeah, I think caution about some of these survey results should be exercised. But I think also it's going to be difficult to tell in terms of how much of a swing factor there will be towards either the US or China, especially in the next few months, depending on whether the ground invasion of Rafah carried out by the Israelis actually takes place and how much damage, destruction and death will continue to be done. And that might have a lasting impact that could probably have an impact on elite opinion, depending on how much outrage is uh, reflected in the public. So I guess more to come and more hard work on your part. Mostly on Jerika's part, but yeah. In that case, Annalena, thank you so much for steering this episode. Andreka, thanks for both crunching all of these numbers again this year and for joining us today. And thanks all of you for listening. We'll be back in another two weeks with the next episode of Southeast Asia Radio. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of Southeast Asia Radio. Write us with any comments, questions, or feedback at searadio at csis.org, and we'll get back to you. Do us a favor and subscribe and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever streaming platform you listen to us on. Tell your friends about us. Marla Hiller is our producer. Our interns are Angus Lam and Tappy Lung. Our co-hosts today were Greg Poling and Alina Noor. My name is Lauren Mai. And I'm Jaffet Kitsan. And we'll see you in two weeks for another episode of Southeast Asia Radio. Thank you.